music turned off, does that mean it's time to talk? <laughs> All right. Uh, so welcome to Storage Vendors Are Killing Cinder. Don't tell anybody, but it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, uh, so <laughs> who am I and why should you listen to me? I can answer the first question. Uh, I'm Corey Stone. I work at Rackspace and uh, have worked on this cloud block storage thing uh, since it's been a project. Uh, and I'm a self-admitted rabble rouser in the Cinder community. I like to hang out in Pounce OpenStack Cinder. Uh, I'm Guitarzan, and I like to answer questions, but even more, I really like to uh, play devil's advocate when people start introducing interesting conversations. Um, and I'm always on the side of simplicity, uh, even at the cost of maybe something being less than ideal. And I found out that titles are super important. Uh, I put my name on three summit proposals, uh, hoping that one of them would get in. Hoping that more than one, but it turns out. Uh, the first one was going to give details on the backstory uh, and the current story of Lunar, which is uh, Rackspace's own homegrown uh, LVM back end for Cinder. Um, people have been asking that, so I figured, you know, everybody likes that, and they've been asking about it for a long time, but uh, not, not accepted. Also, uh, a coworker of mine submitted a talk about how we deploy our environment, uh, salt stacks all hot and stuff like that, and our transition from uh, straight working straight out of the Ubuntu archive uh, to our own deployments. Uh, but I found out that if you propose an antagonistic sounding topic and you put a BuzzFeed title on it, you are in for sure. Um, here's a few examples if you need help with your own uh, sessions next, next summit. Uh, and they do say like vendor X and vendor Y. Uh, if you've been around Cinder long enough, you may know uh, who the inspirations were for a couple of the things that, I, that will show up. So it's interesting, but I've heard half of my talk being given already by other people at the summit. So apparently this is a, this is a big deal. People are all about interoperability, and these questions uh, I find are very important uh, from Cinder, Cinder's perspective. Uh, so I'm going to ask those questions. They may not have good answers, uh, and then just some crazy tangent, tangential stuff at the end. This is the example of a terrible PowerPoint slide because it's just a wall of text. Uh, it turns out that this wall of text is actually Cinder's mission statement from the wiki. Uh, if we want to digest that a little bit, we say that we access block storage resources. I put that in quotes because in our mission statement, we, would, we don't define what that is. Uh, and we use the term that everybody likes, software-defined storage. Uh, nobody agrees what that is either. Uh, so this is a, a marketing speak. Somebody came up with a pretty good, put pretty good words together for our mission statement. Uh, bad slide number two. This is the OpenStack mission statement from the wiki. I can leave it up there if you want to read it, but uh, <laughs> this one's pretty easy. And this is an amazing mission statement, actually. Uh, OpenStack really wants to be the ubiquitous cloud. It wants to be everything for everyone. Uh, but it also wants to be simple to operate and implement, and it wants to be scalable regardless of if you're a public cloud down to a, just a little company that wants to build a lab. Uh, I'm immediately reminded of the project management saying, you can have something fast, good, or cheap. Pick any two. Uh, so I, I find that mission very inspiring, but seems very difficult. Uh, and last, this is some text off of DefCore's wiki. Its actual mission statement was very recursive, so I didn't think that was very useful. But it's, it's very simple. DEF Core's entire goal is interoperability uh, in these three areas. So we have OpenStack and kind of Cinder wanting to be everything for everyone. But we also have DEF Core that wants to battle that a little bit and have everyone conform to some set of standards. Uh, and as a Cinder community, because we have 50 drivers or whatever the huge number is now. Uh, I find this directly important to us and we need to have a really clear perspective for our own reasons. So the first question is pretty obvious. How much interoperability makes sense for us? Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, a loaded question. 
everyone has their own opinion, and it usually involves, uh, you know, whatever I want. That means interoperability. Uh, we've had several discussions in OpenStack, not just in Cinder, but where someone will come up with some case where one one cloud or one install works slightly different than the other, and the statement is, well, they need to fix their cloud. Uh, like there's some objective source of truth that says this is what it should be. Uh, and thinking like that, uh, I don't find helpful uh, or useful in any conversation. Well, let's see. But so we have, then we have this little, this little battle uh, between Def Core versus vendors versus OpenStack. Vendors obviously want Cinder to do whatever they, their stuff can do. OpenStack wants to be everything and still be uniform. Uh, so I think for Cinder, it's, it's pretty obvious that the answer isn't going to be 100% or 0%. Everything, there will always be a difference. And I think we need to just embrace that attitude. Uh, your cloud is not going to be exactly the same as my cloud. My storage backend will absolutely have different characteristics than yours. Uh, you will have some features that I don't have. So we need to uh, decide what does it mean to be interoperable. So the next question is pretty simple, but the answer is not. What should Cinder do? Well, at its core, it's just another OpenStack API. So it does everything that everything else, every other OpenStack API does. It presents you this this set of objects and it has a DB schema to control that and all that crazy RPC stuff. And, but the question really is, you know, what, which parts of the interface between Cinder and those backends, uh, like what should that be and which one, what parts of that interface should we care about? Uh, this is hilarious. John had almost this exact same idea earlier. Uh, one, one idea is we can have a very minimal set of things that are part of the interoperability discussion. Uh, I don't want to put, I, don't, I could make up a statistic on the spot, but I would just say most of our users, at least in the public cloud, they just want a volume. They just want storage. Uh, they would be almost fine with, hey, Cinder, create me a volume and uh, tell me how I can attach that volume to my instance. And really, all of those guys would just go away. I'm done, that's all I need. Um, we have a few more really common uh, operations and some just default implementations in the volume manager that you know, I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of, uh, whole lot of disagreement about. And then on the other side is there's, there's the attitude of, well, I can fix this problem in software, so I'm gonna do it. We are devs, and we like to solve these edge case problems that we imagine that never actually happen. Um, so you can take the we can take the other approach and take the the uh, you have to do absolutely everything that we can support, uh, or we'll kick you out of the tree. I, I love that argument; it's it's so useful. Um, So the problem with that idea, one of the problems with that idea is as we start to implement more and more advanced features, uh, our reference implementation is completely left out in the cold. Um, we have LVM, and what that means in most cases, it's just local LVM on a small Linux box. There are people that I assume are doing LVM on like big back backends where they have lots of space, but LVM really falls apart on small storage nodes. From Rackspace's perspective, I would say that the LVM driver, you can't even really use it. Uh, LVM has, this, has snapshots and clones, but in any real environment, those boxes are gonna get full and just blow up. Uh, so that's, that's kind of, that would be bad for us. We wouldn't really like that. Uh, in fact, the main difference between our driver and just the basic driver is we just don't let that happen. We, we're not gonna have snapshots blow up our storage nodes. That's, that would be. I would get lots more phone calls. Um, but we've added these new features like replication and consistency groups that are completely foreign to this, to that implementation. The next slide is the best slide ever. Um, 
People know what this is? All right. So the minute that I proposed this idea, I, I knew that I would have a slide with the center compatibility matrix on it. And it took me like three or four browsers to actually get one that would let me zoom it out far enough to fit it on one slide. Um, so there it is. Uh, it does show that there is a, a wide swath of features that are very widely implemented and a newer swath of features that are very, very sparsely implemented. The problem with this discussion is all these vendors can do more stuff than Cinder exposes. Um, the whole point of, of vendors is to sell themselves. This is my value add. This is the thing that I do better than someone else. Uh, that's why you need to my, buy my product. So for them, they obviously want, you know, they want to have that thing in Cinder. Um, the problem is, even though those features will be comparable, like, so my vendor X version of this feature, I'll still say Y it's better than vendor Y's version of this feature, and here's the differences. Uh, whenever someone proposes one of these new features, we just get lost in the weeds. Wait, we immediately go down to details and terminology, and everybody disagrees about what those things mean. And we usually just, you know, the discussions just usually die out. So how do we reconcile that idea of uh, the ubiquitous cloud? I want to do everything for everyone, but still be the same, uh, still conform to some level of interoperability. Um, I wonder if the fact that we do get into all of these ridiculous arguments every time that uh, a new feature gets proposed, I wonder if that in itself is a good excuse to say that those features probably shouldn't be first class citizens in Cinder. I, I wrote my outline long before I wrote the slides out and you know planned out what I was going to say. So I had this question, what shouldn't Cinder do? And that's actually a really hard question to have any sort of concrete answer. Again, the vendors are like, Vendors would absolutely say, well, why wouldn't you implement shiny feature X? I don't have any good arguments for them. I mean, uh, that's, that's their whole point of existence, right? So the question is, is there a way for us to make everybody happy? Probably not, but uh, implement some of these things without making Cinder just horrible and, and huge and impossible to, to understand and catch on to. Uh, switching gears a little bit, we like to talk about configuration all the time. Uh, and I will admit that the docs around all of the configuration options aren't amazing. Um, this is compounded by the fact that OpenStack loves to deprecate things. Uh, OpenStack loves to rename configuration options and move them into their own sections and do all this stuff at will, uh, which makes it really difficult to keep up with that stuff. Uh, if it happens to be a topic that you're passionate about, I know the docs team would absolutely love any help uh, trying to keep this stuff straight. So I have a trick question, obviously. People complain about the number of config options. Anybody know what my answer is going to be? Bam! Duncan! Thank you. Not enough config options. Uh, I. Always, uh, I am strongly on the side of operator choice. Uh, maybe that's not obvious, but for a long time, we made a focused effort to ask the Cinder community to have independent snapshots, for example. Uh, we wanted to be able to say, if your backend can let you have a snapshot without having a volume, let, let go for it. So uh, that, was a, that was a fight where we were asking for a config option that would let us, let us do what we want. We lost that fight. Whatever. And then there's also this discoverability dream. The idea that I would go out and purchase some, you know, $100,000 piece of hardware and plug it into my cloud and just flip a switch on and expect it to work the way I want it to work out of the box uh, seems a little misguided. I think it should probably be a big deal when I add a, an entirely new storage back into my cloud. And it's in my best interest to know how that thing works. 
uh, and to know how to twist any knobs that I'm concerned about twisting. Um, and I think the vendors should be in that same, should have that same mindset. You know, you want your customers to know how your product works and help them to do the things that they want to do with that. And leading into my next topic, it's not really that difficult to set up a volume type and cinder. Uh, my favorite topic by far, uh, volume types. What's a volume type? In cinder, it's just a label, nothing, nothing more. All a volume type is is, hey customers, here's a list of things that you can try to create. We keep trying to uh, apply more semantic meaning to these things, and I'm not convinced that it's actually making our problems any better. As I said before, most of our customers just want a volume. They just want space for their little cloudy app to run, uh, and that's all they care about. In the second case, you have customers that absolutely do care. They want feature X. They want QoS specific, like they want this, these characteristics. Uh, they want encryption because they think that your DC ops techs are gonna rip the drives out of the, out of the boxes and run. Um, all of these features can be solved with just volume types. We don't actually have to do anything for them. Uh, things started getting really complicated when we decided that in some, in some universe we were gonna have a bunch of different backends in our cloud and we were gonna try to expose these comparable but very different backend features and we were gonna expose those through the same volume type. Maybe someone's doing that, but if so, I think you're kinda crazy. Um, those customers that actually want those very specific features, they're probably not going to be convinced by you saying, what we have is good enough. They're going to say, what is the thing? Right? And trying to map those things to multiple backends just seems like you're asking yourself for a lot of trouble. Uh, and about volume types, I'm of the opinion that Cinder should care a heck of a lot less about those things. Uh, s quick story time. We were running CloudBlock storage on Grizzly for a long time. Uh, like I said, it's, it's basically just a simple LVM backend, so there's not a whole lot of features that we needed. Uh, however, Grizzly had a whole bunch of terrible performance problems once you got over a lot of volumes. Um, so thank you to whatever devs helped out, helped us out by fixing some of the API uh, N plus ones and the DB N plus ones because uh, upgrading from G to H to I made a huge difference. However, when we upgraded from G to H, we found, it, we found out that you could no longer even attempt to create a volume from a snapshot that came from a different type. It just, the API is like, no, go away. So before upgrade, everything's all happy, tests all pass, after upgrade, the world blew up because the API is just like, no. And I'm like, why? So <laughs> we did API hijacking to work around this, but uh, then we upgraded from H to I. Before H to I, clone from one type to another type, after H2I, bam, the world blows up. Um, whatever, I, I don't know why we want to care about things that uh, are not necessarily, like, like, like these are features, these are API validations that just came out of nowhere. So the thing about volume types is, uh, as I said before, all of these things can be handled simply by keys and values on your volume type. Uh, encryption is already an option in a bunch of drivers. Uh, I think most of those are actually just back-end turn encryption on for everything, but uh, you could actually do that on a per-volume basis if your back-end would let you do that. Um, QoS is one of the huge rat holes that we get into every, every six months or so. Uh, we had a great discussion a couple years ago when capabilities first came up where we were arguing about what an IOP was. Uh, we were arguing about throughput metrics, what they were. We were arguing about like what is a full read. It was it was absolutely bizarre. Uh, John's been putting QoS on volume types uh, forever, and there didn't need to be any code in Cinder to do any of this stuff. Uh, replication is another case where I think you could simply set up your backend to be replicated. Your customer could buy that replicated volume type, and they'd know that if a meteor hit your building, their data would be safe. And that's really what's most important. Any of these volume characteristics can be, can just be configured. And lastly, there's this other push, which is kind of slowed down, but 
why would we want to expose these maintenance operations on your back end and sender? Is it that hard to use your product that you don't want your customer to ever touch your storage device? Uh, it seems like, again, you as a vendor want to help your customer out and help them help them learn, help them know how your, how your product works. Uh, I do have some sympathy for this replication failover thing. That seems pretty common, but the, the problem that I see with that is simply that uh, if something really bad happens, your customer's guest VM already finds, like it already crashes because like, it's not magic, right? The guest, your customers already know. You have to wake somebody up in the middle of the night anyway. Uh, and they're the one that has to perform the action in sender. I, I, you know, it's, it's one of those features that sounds nice, but when you get down to what it actually means to implement, uh, I don't know what the win is. The guests already crashed because they're read only. It's just, I'm not sure. Uh, it seems like we should, we the center community should want to push back just a little and help the vendors understand that it's actually good to uh, to have knowledgeable customers. And it's, it's also good to write products that your customers can use. Um, so this is where things get crazy, or I thought they were going to get crazy until I heard a comparable, uh, s comparable suggestion about this whole experimental API thing. Uh, so my immediate, my, my version of this before the summit was, what if instead of starting at the top and, and doing the whole design by committee thing and trying to get everybody to agree on what things mean. Uh, what if we did the opposite and gave a playground for vendors to be able to experiment, let them try things out, see what sticks, um, let vendors learn from each other's experiments. Uh, I wonder if we could get some better Maybe just uh, a better opinion if people see what actually has been implemented. Let code talk a little bit and uh, just see what happens if we let people play and we just have less fear of people doing things that we may not understand or agree with. I ripped this quote out of OpenStack Cinder a couple months ago. I don't remember who it was, so I can't attribute it. Does anyone, is it the person here? Anyway, uh, I just wonder what would happen if this wasn't the case, right? What if uh, people felt like they actually could uh, make changes and do cool stuff in any reasonable time frame? And then just some last thoughts about vendor stuff. Code reviews are code reviews suck. Nobody likes code reviews. Uh, I think the pain is probably felt by the vendors more than anyone else. We always have this argument about when does your when does your driver have to be in in order to be considered for that release? Um, how, how do I get someone to actually review my driver? I mean, these, these questions are not new and they uh, are clearly a pain point because they keep coming up. And I do recommend reading that spec, uh, make plugins external libs. I, I'm not convinced it's a good idea. I probably don't think it's a good idea at all, but I do recommend reading it. Uh, CI, CI people gripe about it, but really it's the only way that any of us know that any driver code actually executes. Uh, there are some some Cinder devs that are really good at reading code. Uh, I'm not one of those, uh, but none of us can actually execute any of that code. Uh, so just mad props to all the all the infra people and uh, all the focus on the CI stuff. So. In closing, OpenStack, as we keep hearing, is trying to become this big enterprise thing. I still don't know what that means, uh, and I'm not convinced that I like it. But as, as it becomes more and more, and it grows up more and more, uh, I think that us as a center community need to have a very clear picture. Uh, I think we need to have it out in the open, and we need to know what what it means to be interoperable for us. I think we should be able to help make that, drive that discussion for our, par for our part in the DEF core stuff. Um, we could just continue to be more designed by committee and uh, just say no all the time, uh, but I really hope that we don't and that we 
make that that interoperability set as small as we can, uh, as small as is reasonable, and let people experiment and try to do awesome things uh, with the rest of their stuff. Thank you. And I definitely, yeah, definitely want <laughs> feedback. And yeah, he's got one right here. So, have you tried buying Monty Taylor three whiskeys and then telling me you want clouds to have different API behaviors, like um, ca can move between two types or not with the clone? Um, because I guarantee there'll be an explosion. An explosion he, of, of, of vehement disagreement. As Infra are already having a nightmare with all the tiny differences in APIs. They want those locked down and fixed, not more of them. Like, as uh, Infra are one of the biggest cross cloud users, cross cloud cloud design co design know of at the moment, and they're already sure. with the limited differences we've got having an absolute nightmare. They're saying sure. if, 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 we, if, if differences spiral, they just won't be able to write cl cross cloud, cloud apps. Sure. Now, well, there's lots of, lots of customers who want to go cross cloud, and we're going to tell them basically no. Wait, wait, wh why, how did you make that leap to uh, saying no? Well, because they won't be able to do it. Mon the people who are trying to do it are saying if, the, if more differences creep in, you won't be able to write the code. It'll be too difficult to keep it up to date and etc. That's, that's only if they want to use that feature that only works on the back end. But how do you tell what features work on what back end and what don't? I mean, the, the idea of locking down things like cross-type clone in Cinder was that it didn't work on most back ends. 90% of the time, it failed. 90% of configurations, it failed totally. Well, I, I'm not going to argue with that. I mean, I'm just saying the things that I think we should care about is a smaller set than everything, right? And if volume type cloning between types, if people really think that that's number one, a a huge deal uh, and really common or really un like if it's a really common thing then why not make it work if it's an uncommon thing why would you care if it's not in if it's not a, a standard or if it's not enforced and, and like I said there's no I claim that there are no objective truths here but I will fight for I will always be on the side of vendor choice or operator choice in this discussion. So, so the answer from Infra, and Monty has been jumping up and down quite literally saying this in a couple of talks already in the last two days, is the little, che the little things do matter. Because some, if somebody sure. writes for them, all of a sudden that code doesn't work in all the other places. I will absolutely let people have their opinions on that. I mean, I'm not going to say that they're right or wrong. I'm going to say uh, cloning between types is reasonable. And if it doesn't work, what's the, fail what, uh, what's the pain of it not working? It means you have to work around that, or it, it's a shortcut, right? You can either have the shortcut or not have the shortcut. And, and if you don't want to have that option, that's fine. Again, I'm not saying it's true. It's like, I'm not saying this is absolute truth. I'm saying I tend to be on the side of operator choice and configurability. People like Infra are not in, on that side. They're very much loudly not Correct. On that Monty side. is actually where I got that quote from, go fix your cloud. I don't want to answer for you. I, I want to say that I, I think you did a great job, and I agreed with a lot of the, the statements that you made. Um, you know, the, the cloud compatibility thing, um, one thing that I think is often forgotten in that is the whole reason that we use types and that we used to recommend the use of types to do that sort of thing is because that's left to the operator and the admin to actually configure that properly. Sure. And it means that you don't have the compatibility problems that, sure. that Duncan is saying and stuff like that. In my opinion, if you have multiple types that aren't compatible and that doesn't work, then you screwed up. You screwed up your cloud and that's your problem. That is not an OpenStack problem or a cloud problem and it certainly would never show up in Infra anyway because Infra doesn't even do anything with types. It only creates arbitrary types that don't do anything. So it doesn't really matter, but anyway. I thought you did a great job, and I think sure. you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> you heard it here, guys. He was on camera, on microphone. Hello. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. Sure. Um, do you know what happened with shared volumes on Cinder? 
I think it was, there was a blueprint. The there. multi-attach stuff? Yes. Talk to you. Oh, where is he? Oh, he's right there. <laughs> so it, the, the short answer is it's really hard to make that drastic of a change in Nova, mm. and it's taken a lot longer than we expected. Is, is it planned to work any, in any time? I mean, yes. I, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And uh, one last question. Sure. Okay. Um, do we have a do nothing driver? Because I see a lot of customers saying that, well, Cinder, it's not going to work on our environment. We, we, we're just going to do it outside of Cinder, just attach it with our regular, I don't, I don't know, maybe web, web GUIs. And if we do that, now uh, OpenStack DB doesn't know about this drive. And when it tries to delete, it says, oh, I failed to delete because there's something attached that I don't know. Oh, I see. So you, you're you still going to use Nova attach yeah. and detach? And But do nothing. Just Gotcha. Uh, yes. No, no. Yeah, such a thing doesn't exist. That's actually interesting. Uh, I've never thought about yeah, I've I, never I, thought I, about I, like I doing it. everything ex like doing everything outside of Cinder except the attach and detach. I mean, I see where it's coming from, but I don't think anyone's too interested in implementing well, that. Oh, I want that. <laughs> hey, but if it's a do nothing driver, it will be extremely easy to write. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that yeah. would that would actually well, be extremely well, easy to. But seriously, I, I do see a lot of customers saying like, um, for like, example, Hyper-V, it, it uses iSCSI for LVM, and a lot of customers say, no, iSCSI, I want I want Sam Fabric. Gotcha. And then then, say, then we have to say, well, sorry, then we have to do it outside of Cinder. So no one's no one's implemented this the yes. the Fabric stuff in the Hyper-V. Uh, yes. So now we have a problem saying that okay, so let's do it outside of Cinder. And now we, when we say Nova Dilly, oh, it's it's yeah, gonna it's gonna can't detach because it crashes. Yes, yeah, yeah, I got you. So uh, I really want that. Do well, so there's two answers, right? Yeah. So there's there's you could write a, a very simple do nothing driver, mm -hmm. um, or you could try to talk to the Hyper V folks to make yeah, the, yeah. the other fabrics work. As long as you write CI for it. <laughs> <laughs> True. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, there you go. What? He promised it. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Oh, that's, thank you very much. Sure. So the one thing I totally and utterly agree with you on is we need a way for experimental APIs and playing and trying things out. Sure. A couple of people have proposed that you even make that really explicit and you have to put a header in your client request that says, I know this is experimental <laughs> nice. and it might go away. And if I'm relying on this and I come and cry at the summit, then you're allowed to it's laugh bad. at me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, there is somebody else saying, well, as soon as you put a feature up, somebody will build something on it. So uh, sure. I, I very much think those people are wrong. And it's, I, I agree with the safety margin of putting experimental and I'm sure. not allowed to complain in a header kind of thing. But I think we really do need a way of doing experimental stuff, and that would have made things like replication. We could have iterated that in the experimental space for as long as it needs until people can agree. Yeah, I, I, I think if the general case of you know executing random code in your driver had come up before <laughs> replication or consistency groups or uh, or a lot of this stuff, uh, it would have been really interesting to watch the ride. Um, I don't know if there is a next one planned. Uh, unfortunately, replication was the big one that you know is now going through its second thing. But I, yeah, I totally agree. I think I think if we would have solved that problem and and allowed that initially, I th we could have saved ourselves a lot of pain. And like I said, I'm I'm not really a storage guy. I I don't know what the next one is, but uh, hopefully we can use it. So I was excited about the title of the presentation. Yep. But I had maybe something else in mind. Sure. I think a lot of the times when someone proposes a new feature, they're coming from a vendor, I speak from experience, <laughs> um, you kind of have your own storage in mind and maybe not really focused on what the API should look like, on what the behavior should be. and you kind of make it work for your own thing because that's what you know. Mm -hmm. And then every other vendor will come and say, well, 
that doesn't, my storage doesn't work like that, so let's change the API. And then my storage doesn't work like that, let's change the API. And it would be great to just do it reverse. Like, let's decide what the API should be. And then if your storage doesn't work like that, we'll make your storage well, work like so that. So the problem <laughs> is that's exactly how it works. That's, what we do. that's exactly how, how traditional great. OpenStack stuff works. And we get things that, so the problem is that doesn't allow you to that doesn't allow you to quickly change things, right? So I'd like to say that we're really good at that, but we're terrible at it. Like we just we just don't do it well. We we've, we've never been able to uh, agree on anything, right? So to to then go and say you need to change the way your storage works is also pretty unfair. Uh, maybe maybe that thing is just something that isn't easily abstractable. Um, while you can do anything in software, right, that doesn't mean it's going to look good. Uh, and since we've never tried it, I just think it would be very interesting to see what happens if we could try the other way around. Because that has been the way that it's, it's gone all the time. Uh, we implemented this QoS specs thing after, you know, two months, two years of, of talking about what it looks like. Uh, instead of just, well, personally that's an example of something that I don't think need, does anything, but that's a case where we, we argue and try to come up with a solution, and I don't know who's happy with the solution ever. So I'm, I'm just suggesting trying it the other way around. I think given the fact that we haven't had the ability to do experimental APIs, the fact that it's sometimes taken quite a while to get features implemented is not necessarily a bad thing either though especially since now the TC is saying that we can't ever <laughs> change the APIs, we can't ever remove things from APIs. So, you know, if we, if we had the experiment, uh, experimental APIs back in the day, then I think we would have been able to do things a little bit more quickly and, sure. and experiment and try to get things in. But to simply say that we've, we've never been able to agree on something and never been able to get something done is is not actually accurate either. Well, so, I mean, <coughs> I mean it, it's obviously it's, it's not a, an extremist statement, right? So right, yeah, yeah. That's true. I know. Um, uh, but we, we're still committing code. Uh, right. I, I just it's an evolving process. Happy. That's all I'm saying. Like, it, it's an evolving process, and with things that are as complicated as replication, you know, a lot of us, including John and, and others in the room, we've spent a lot of time trying to make it work for all of us, and, you know, it's... Vendors obviously have a motivation to get those things in, right? Um, but it's, I don't think we've ever come at it from a perspective like, hey, I'm going to really put it to solid fire because our <laughs> array is so much better or whatnot. We, at least the developers in the community, really want to make Cinder work. Sure. I, myself yeah, included. I, I'm, so. I'm not attributing anything to Malice, right? Um, but replication is a great example. There's the replication v1, right? How many drivers implemented it? One? Uh, so I just wonder if if we're if we're just not really you know honest when we say that we we do uh, cooperate well and come up with something with, that we all like because I mean that's there's only a couple good examples and unfortunately that's one of them. Sure. Totally agree. So yes, drivers have the option of optimizing that in the future, and I hope all do. But certainly for features that work everywhere, we've bought those several times very successfully. And even things like your clone to a different volume type, if you did a generic version of that based on the generic migration code, sure. that could drop straight in and it would just work. I don't think you get any pushback at all. That's already there. No, so uh, it, since he doesn't have a mic, he, he uh, Duncan pointed out that uh, an amazing example of a counter a counter example where uh, just recently, backups from attached volumes just like got in, it, and it was yeah, like you said, it was actually a, a, an amazing example of uh, where and a feature could get added uh, that was pretty much universal and with like because because we have uh, Cinder doing all the work, uh, the the generic implementation for that just works and everybody wins. So I mean that's a, that's a great counterexample. 
Another pretty good example of that is the uh, the work that um, <coughs> that Pure Storage recently did with the image caching um, capability. Um, I did a lot of testing of it. It didn't work for our driver, but I wasn't going to block it. You know, I I filed a bug and I sure. committed a fix to our driver, um, and we're still working on that. But uh, it definitely helps the entire community to to add something like that. Yeah, so. uh, I I think that's probably true in these cases where Cinder's kind of kind of uh, doing automation, um, workflowy type stuff, where it is absolutely not necessarily a driver thing. Uh, I, th I think you did have some sort of image cache thing, right? Um, but the general solution, the general purpose uh, implementation for the image cache thing, yeah, is another good win. Yeah, that's pretty spectacular, I'd say. Yeah, yes, right, yeah. The, the copy and white, copy and write image stuff, yeah. One more comments to example, for example, uh, replication. You just mentioned in replication view one, only one driver implement this version, right? That is why uh, we have a uh, version two that is simplify oh. the replication. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I believe that more and more drivers will support replication v2. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so no, that, that's, that's kind of my point though, right? So iteration works. I mean, I don't think there's any argument that iteration doesn't work. The, the question is, could it have been quicker or uh, maybe I'll just say more interesting if multiple people had tried to implement repl replication and we could have seen which solution people preferred? <laughs> yeah, oh, I totally agree. So one thing I'd be curious what you think, especially from an operator's perspective. Um, my, my belief is that one of the things that makes this difficult is the insistence that we have all of these APIs and all these API calls. Um, there's actually a, a replication v0.1 that I did back in Essex sure. um, that is in production that is nothing but volume types. It doesn't use any API calls or anything. Um, no, no, and, yeah, no. and one of the things that I question is do you focus more on putting those custom things in a type in, in encapsulating them, as opposed to requiring that there are all these APIs added all the time until you're ready. Sure, uh, replication is a great example. Like uh, that's why I spoke about it. Uh, I question. I, I see where it comes from, but I, I question the, the need for this failover thing in Cinder. I mean, replication failover is already human intensive and customer impacting. So maybe we make it slightly easier by having a Cinder call, but. How much easier really is it? I, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> we'll hear it. So one thing I can say with absolute certainty, having spent the last three weeks in meetings with them, is that our customers absolutely want, absolutely want this abstracting, and that is a huge sale point for OpenStack. There are customers who are moving to OpenStack because of all this abstraction. They don't want to go the and train up failover? on Re replication is one of them that you sure. know they really like to see replication work but in general no they don't want to log into their storage front ends and web GUIs and do things there okay. they absolutely don't because that locks them in with training it locks them in with all sorts of things and uh, yeah. it's, it's a sales point for them I mean it's okay saying well they're not saying tough that's an option but it's definitely a value proposition for for certain customers and there are some fairly large slow IT crowds, you know, civil, sure. civ civil service, et cetera, who are looking at OpenStack now. And the value proposition of OpenStack is the, the fact that they can move between solutions in a couple of years' time or on the next cloud or sure. the, the parallel cloud and require far less training and far less, not zero, but far less. Yeah, uh, I, I, do have, I do have sympathy for that, that case. I, I understand it. It, it's, it. it sounds really good. And mm. if people are happy with replication v2, Hey, more power to us. Way to go. Go team. I, I'd, I'd love to see it in an experimental API, API till we're happy with it, because sure. it makes just iteration fast, faster and easier. But um, there, is def there is a definite value proposition to things like replication being sure. somewhat baked into Cinder, rather than they're having to go and poke a web console that's specific to NetApp, specific to SolidFire, specific to EMC. So sure. There are customers who love that. Sure. And we'll hand over big bucks to OpenStack vendors hey. to do that. Who doesn't like big bucks?
So in defense of the replication API, <laughs> and not, <laughs> not the API itself, but its, its existence, um, I think it's necessary for a user who wants DR, a full DR solution, to be able to go to the destination cloud and be able to clone their volume and to run a VM off it and to see, okay, my DR really works. And sometimes in the real world, that takes 10 or 15 or 20 tries mm -hmm. until you configure everything right on your VM to get it working. And you can't rely no. on the admin at the destination site because your storage is replicating your data and there's no cinder on the other side and there's nothing else on the other side. You can't rely on the admin to test your DR for you if it's a, a cloud. Sure, but that's still, it's not something that a customer can do, right? That's something yes. that the admin does. No, a customer the can customers do Customers can it. do the failover? That would be. <coughs> in no, okay, well, well, maybe then that's a flow on V2 and we need V3. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I can't believe we're still talking about replication. But, uh, you know, so I, I oh, jeez. But uh, I'm, uh, 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 let me, <laughs> let, let me say something here. I'm, I, I'm a little confused through the process of the presentation here. I think I see what you're trying to get at. And your concern about vendors that have functionality that everybody can support. Um, we're talking about the importance of replication, but that's an example of one that doesn't work in the reference platform. So it kind of, it seemed like you were saying two different things there. But what I want to get at, let's move beyond replication, let's talk about the next thing, whatever that may be. We have customers who want to get into the cloud who have been using storage for years and who have had functionality that goes far beyond what Cinder is doing right now. And I don't think we can say, no, we're not going to do it for them if we're going to continue to have OpenStack be relevant and move forward. So what we have to do is we have to figure out a way to work out together as vendors, as developers, as cross-company people. You know, I don't care whether I'm from IBM, whether I'm from NetApp or HP. We got to figure out a way to solve this. And I think maybe that's what you're trying to get at in this presentation, yes? Well, so uh, more clearly, what my real point was, was simply that uh, the interoperability discussions should tend to shy away from those complicated abstract, complicated abstractions and those features that are not global. That was the main point. Uh, so what that means, and then the, the idea that we can have this uh, set of experimental APIs where that vendor that, that wants to implement that thing, they can just do it, right? But, but then how do we actually, so we've got experimental, we still have to get beyond the point where we agree that that's gonna become part of the product, or are we saying it never does? I'm saying that vendors may have their own things. What, whatever that thing is, right? I'm saying your vendor may not agree with this feature at all. I'm saying it is okay for there to be uh, features that are outside of the interoperati uh, interoperability discussion completely. Yeah, I think that touches a little bit on what John was getting at earlier today with the ability of doing plugins that are external. Yeah, yeah, the whole contrib and, thing and, and, and the contrib APIs, thing. I yeah. think that works really well with the, with that's respect that's why to I that. was I was kind of yeah. both happy because I thought it would be more well received because a couple other people have very ex very well thought out opinions about this already uh, and mine was just yet another uh, you know and without any without actually implementing a plug-in mechanism within cinder there's no real way for a vendor to actually start doing those things without some major you know calisthenics within the code base which is kind of painful well, you know and then I, I was gonna say well. so <laughs> if, if you want my, my absolute crazy idea and this may be a terrible idea is to have one, one generic uh, API RPC uh, driver call that the vendors can do dynamic dispatch. You can call, you can say whatever you want, and you can pass it whatever you want, and you can do whatever you want in that call. So if you want to perform an operation on a volume, 
that way uh, we could have even Cinder client have a generic command, right? Just pass down whatever the heck you want to your send to your driver. Yeah, just do stuff. Here's a package, do stuff. And then you could pass it down to the driver, the do stuff driver for that volume and just cut the do nothing driver and the do stuff. Right. <laughs> yes. I mean, so I mean, I don't know if that's a good idea, but that's that's one way where you know, free reign. Drivers or vendors could have free reign to to play around, to, to try this stuff. And, and that's that's fine, but that doesn't necessarily get Cinder off the hook here, because then off you've what got... Hook? So, so I, was, I don't know if you going to say anything else, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I knew I'd eventually... Well, I, I'm curious, because, you know, we just had a... You, just had a you, you said there's all these wonderful features and everything that Cinder doesn't do or implement. Well, a couple hours ago, I said, what are the features that we're not doing? Because from my perspective, I agree with, with Corey's slide, create, delete, attach. <laughs> it's really kind of the key, right? And so I asked that question and nobody answered, including yeah, you. I have a um, example. Hold on. Yeah, the real example is a customer wants to additional features. For example, uh, we have a, a traffic and traffic uh, We have a iSCSI connection, but you know, maybe we have uh, several ports. So some ports uh, the customer wants to use by OpenStack. They want to just uh, uh, set a, a restriction about the port range. So this is maybe a future. I don't, I'm not sure this is a general thing. No, so I, I agree with that. Thank you. That's a big difference from saying we're missing all of these great features oh. that they've had for years. Well, There's no. a big difference. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that, but I just want to I want to focus on the fact that if we have some great advanced feature that we need to put in there, it should still be outside of the interoperability discussions. Yeah. That's that's my whole point. It doesn't need to be agreed on. So the only one downside that I could see to this, which is kind of a little bit of a red herring, but um, if you upfront allow people to do whatever I want, they want in the experimental, which I think has a lot of value, and I, I definitely support that. Um, the downside to that is is that you don't upfront require you to actually talk to other people to see if it makes sense to do it a certain way. Agreed. And yeah. that. There is value in the community there by forcing yourself to talk with others in, in, in the community to do those things. Sure. I mean, I so you will still get, uh, I mean, you still have to go through Garrett, right? So people will still have to look at your code. Um, but it, it, is a, it is totally true. Um, maybe we would or wouldn't require blueprints for stuff like this where people would actually say, you know, you're completely insane or, oh, that's a great idea. Why haven't we already done this? I mean, it, it's totally true that if, as we, if we let it become more Wild West, it will become more Wild West. Wait, yes. you, were, you were complaining about that feature feature chart, and it's actually a very simple chart. You know, it, it's fairly linear progress. Sure. Drivers implement things later and later. So I, I don't think that's avoidable, given we've got 50 drivers and some things require driver changes. We can't change 50 drivers to get a feature in, I think. Otherwise, features would take forever to get in. I don't... I'm I don't follow. You, you put up the slide with the, yeah, with yeah. the feature matrix. Yeah. To avoid the need for that feature matrix, you have to make everything standard. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, sure. your feature matrix is going to explode. As soon as you allow vendors to support or not support something, that feature matrix is going to explode and probably become n-dimensional. And you know, <laughs> what releases support what and what driver is going to, um, uh, uh, going to get more. That, that support matrix is going to be way more complicated than it already is. I will say that's true to some extent. Um, but I think it's slightly different when instead of having a standard feature and the p people that implement it, you have a list of this is my driver and this is the crazy thing that I do with that driver. It, it, it kind of changes the way the, the meaning of the matrix. Does that make sense? So you have this idea of here's all the stuff that Cinder really cares about. This is the interoperability stuff. This is the stuff that matters. And then you've got this stuff, oh, here's the crazy stuff that vendor X and Y are doing. And with these drivers, you can make this crazy call. Uh, so, but what's crazy, what, what's crazy today starts to become more standard. I mean, that's what I'd hope is I'm that. Curious. Are there any folks in here that are not Cinder developers that have any questions or comments? <laughs> 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 that's, 
five. Yeah, yeah, this is actually standard cinder, des cinder design session stuff here now. Yeah. At nine tomorrow. I thought we're doing something else then. Damn. So yeah, if we've just devolved into yet another Cinder uh, normal dev design session, uh, I'll just say thank you guys for coming. Um, ho hopefully we just uh, open the conversation. That's really the, the goal. And you've proven your point. We get lost in the weeds. In or this is meta weeds.